No, the question really is, how do you go about choosing a toilet? Well, when you say that, do you mean what features do I want or size? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, all of that. Like, like, you see the toilets here and you're like, wow, there's like automation and they open up automatically, they make noise, they, they clean your butt, they do all this stuff. It's like, wow, mm -hmm. we have nothing like that in America. Well, but they kind of all do that, eh? How do you figure out what, what you okay. want to buy? First off, there's no way in hell I'm dropping five grand on a toilet. So okay. there's going to be a price point at which you go, yeah. But let's say you want a typical porcelain bowl with um, the washer that, you know, that washes your bum for you. Yeah, and remote control. Yeah. So not, not on the side. Right, right but the um, wall yeah. mounted. Yeah, yeah. Thousand bucks. Uh, well, again, at current exchange, more like 850. Ooh. If you want to go from that to also the seat automatically rises when you step in and, you know, <laughs> greets you. Yes, my master. <laughs> um, and automatically flushes for you and has the happy music to hide your bodily function sounds, you know, all the bells and whistles. Uh -huh. You might be looking at anywhere from about two grand up to, I've seen some of them again for about five grand. Now for five grand, does it give you a prostate <laughs> massage or something? I don't know what it does, but in the end, it's a fairly basic machine if you think about it. You sure. Want, you want something that's going to flush every time reliably mm -hmm. and uh, wash your bum. There is a certain confidence you have in knowing that, you know, you have the cleanest anus at a, at a table. <laughs> I suppose here everybody can lay that claim to fame, but if you're the only one in the States who has a washlet, you're going into that corporate meeting knowing you smell fresher oh, than yeah, everybody. Absolutely. absolutely. Right? Well, speaking of that, because it's using this bidet system, mm. during pandemic, did you guys have toilet paper shortages? <sighs> I know that some people hoarded, but there was never a shortage that we encountered. We never went and saw completely empty shelves. Do you know what did run out for a little bit? Okay. Tissue paper. For pulling oh, like your nose your and whatnot. Oh, oh. And how did you find this place? Like, I, how did you end up here in Sun? Well, my Kimberly and I were looking from about 20... 12 or 13. Okay. Around then, as we were approaching, back when we got our permanent residency, you needed to have a minimum of a decade unbroken in Japan, fully employed, and not so much as a parking ticket on your record in order to qualify for permanent residency. It was pretty strict. Has that softened? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's become much, much simpler. I believe it. you can get it in fewer than five years now if you have desirable skills. Mm. Anyway, we knew that we were approaching that 10-year ten, ten bar. So I had begun looking around, and I had always wanted a traditional Japanese house. Even literally as a kid growing up in New York, I wanted a traditional Japanese house. And I looked at about... 300 of them online over those three years and what we would do is the way Japanese real estate listings work they don't give you the address they give you the town and they might even give you a general neighborhood but often they don't what they will give you however is they'll say oh you are two kilometers from the nearest station you are 1.2 kilometers from the nearest convenience store well all you do is you call up Google Maps on aerial view you calculate the radius, do concentric circles, and that takes you probably within a block of 10 houses. Mm. Then, because the listings often have a, at least a front view of the house, you can see what would the shape of the roof be? Is the roof black? Is it blue? Is it something else? And from those details, you can find it. Okay. And then what we would do is, because the reason they don't give you the address, ostensibly, I, it might be so that nobody breaks into an empty house, but genuinely I believe it's a financial thing I think they want their listing agent to be involved with you right from the beginning right right which I don't fault however if I don't even know if I'm truly interested in the house I don't want to meet with somebody I don't want to feel any pressure I just want to go casually look at the neighborhood and get a sense is this where I want to live so what I would do is I, I became I joke you know, CIA level skill at <laughs> sussing out houses based off of this data. And then Kim and I on the weekends, we would go, okay, let's go. And basically we had said anywhere by car in Tokyo, 
radius of two hours. And so we went to Yamanashi, we went to Chiba, we went to Gunma, we came to Tochigi, we went as far north as Fukushima and as far south as Hakone and looked at the houses. The, the thing is though, that there was always something. Like there was this one house in Chiba, beautiful house. And we had a list of sort of um, a, a want list. So I wanted a feature called a Nagayamon, which is a certain kind of external building. Mm. And we wanted it to be a certain distance from a river, close enough to get to it, but not so close that we needed to worry about flooding, etc. Okay. So this Chiba house, it ticked all the boxes. And we visited, just looked at it, you know, from the outside. And we could see that it was actually at the foot of a cliff. And sur surrounding the house were boulders, some about as big as this car. Oh. And we went, nope. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Scratch. Another one we went to, also in Chiba, it was in a beautiful part of Chiba called uh, Kamogawa. Kamo means duck and Kagawa means river. Okay. Um, not too far from a really good surf break, fantastic terraced rice paddies. It was, it was really nice. And it was a good plot of land. I think it was the equivalent of three or four acres, which in Japan is crazy amounts of land. Wow. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> we got there. And there were Suzume Bachi. Suzume means sparrow, Bachi means bee, but they're hornets. They're the Asian Mandarin hornets. Oh. Bigger than my thumb, I'm not exaggerating. Oh. Took a step on the property, saw these giant nests, and went, mm. Plus, although the property was really large, it was actually broken up into several parcels, not connected, they were not contiguous. Oh, that's weird. And we went, uh, okay. Another one, we actually met a realtor and went in. And there were bats. Now, I don't care about bats, but, but when Kimberly walked in and a bat flew out, she went, no. And then she turned around and there was a huntsman spider as big as my hand. It Whoa. was freaking huge. You know, the body was the size of one of those Japanese grapes. Oh my gosh. And <laughs> there was so nope. much nope. So it, there was always something. And we were running out, you know, it was three, three years in. And I had been looking and looking, and Kimberly thought, ah, you know, maybe we just need to take a break. I was pretty dogged about it, though. And I saw this one, the one that we wound up buying. And it was not that we wanted to live in Sano, per se, but the house ticked many of the boxes. It had not a Nagayamon, but it had a Kura, an earthen warehouse, which you'll see. And there was the main house itself, which was um, traditional. It was 130 years old. Well, when we bought it, I think it was about 125 wow. years old. It had, it had um, 3,000 square meters or three quarters of an acre of land, which in Japan, again, is That's quite wild. large. In fact, we had to sign a special paper saying we're not some sort of developers in disguise who plan to subdivide because they refuse to believe that any ordinary person would want so much land. But I don't know, I'm an American at heart. Yeah, yeah, I want my not, space. You're not quite ordinary here. Right? Three quarter of an acre, I'm like, meh, it's, it's not okay. quite big enough. <laughs> exactly. I don't need a huge house, but I want space. That's right. <laughs> and um, it was right at the top of what we were willing to pay. They were asking the equivalent of about 25, 250,000. So, you know, you often hear about these empty houses called Akiya in Japan and how you can get them for a song and, and they, they cost like giving them away. And that is true, you can find them. But invariably, they're going to be pretty rough, right? Hmm. And they may not have any particular features or they're going to be quite remote. Like way further out there. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, like freaking middle of nowhere type. It was right at the limit of what we were willing to spend because we knew that on top of the purchase price, we were going to have to invest a lot in, in rebuilding whatever we bought of that age. But from the moment I saw the property, it has a, a giant mature cherry tree, a huge garden. It has a traditional staircase, which is, um, it's actually a, uh, like a clothes dresser, set of dresser drawers in the shape of stairs called Kaidan Tansu. The, the main beam, the central pillar of the house was 30 centimeter, uh, about a foot by foot square of pure Japanese elm. Uh, and the tokonoma, which is a kind of an alcove, a decorative alcove in a room called a washitsu, our traditional Japanese room. It was built from kurogaki, a kind of black persimmon. And Kimberly's uncle, who is a master carpenter, once told me 
you want to find out if a house is built well, you don't need to spend all day looking. Go straight to the tokonoma, see how it's built and what it's built of. If it's made from top quality materials and it's featuring certain kinds of joinery, guaranteed the rest of the house is built well. So went in, tokonoma was beautiful. Uh, I still wound up doing a fairly thorough investigation anyway because I knew I was going to have to be, you know, the one rebuilding everything. Okay. And it ticked all the boxes. Now, it feels like we are going pretty far outside the city or away from the center. Yeah, I mean, right? it's um, it's 20 minutes from city center, but in Oh, Japan, it is? It is? Okay, so I had always thought from the photos that it was pretty remote. And then I was looking at Sun, I was like, oh, Sun looks kind of like a, a suburb. Yeah, no, no, it you is. It, we're very much... And honestly, you'll see, this is a little more green just because it's agricultural land. Mm -hmm. But uh, our immediate neighbors they're they're all around us if you look at the aerial view of our property our property is huge and, and it's flanked by teeny to little sort of postage stamp size lots oh. the people who built the house back in 1890 ran a light gauge railroad track they were ferrying quarried stone from the hills that way down towards Tokyo and made what appears to be a small fortune so they must have been the fancy pants of the neighborhood back oh, in the day. Okay, okay. Do you know who that family was? So their family name, I know, Ito. But the Ito family sold it to the Hayakawa family around about 1910 or so. And that Hayakawa family had lived in the house for three generations before we got it. The last Hayakawa who lived was the mother of the person from whom we purchased it. She had fallen ill in, in her older age and had been hospitalized and then put into sort of like a daycare service, retirement home sort of thing. The house had sat empty for five years before we got it. Literally, all of the family's items were in it. Three generations of stuff. Wow. Now, Japanese real estate practice says that before it's sold, the owner clears it out entirely. And the owner asked us, do you want me to do that? And I could see that although most of the stuff was garbage, there were some really neat things in there. Uh, period pieces of furniture, other antiques. And so I said, okay, you know what? We'll take it as is, everything in it. <clears throat> that actually got us a small price break on the house, probably saved us, I don't know, 10, 15 grand. Okay. Uh, and as a result, we spent the first year doing nothing other than cleaning. The house was floor to ceiling stacked. The, the mother had kept everything, you know. Wow. And so we would come across, in one box, a string of pearls. And in another box, nothing but candy wrappers that had been ironed flat. It was that bizarre collection of things. It, it, felt, it felt very much like Christmas where you don't know what you're going to get in each box. <laughs> maybe it's amazing and maybe it's a lump of coal, you know? So we, we became very good friends with the staff at our local recycle and trash center because we probably went every weekend for a year. We would hire a truck and load it up full of stuff and take it. And so, you know how Michelangelo, with regards to his sculpting, that he, he was just removing things from the rock to reveal <coughs> the, the figure that was within it. Yes. I feel that for the first year, we were just removing things that covered the beauty of the house. And then once we got it down to where there wasn't very much in the house, the architectural bones were, could, could really shine. And then from there, I began rebuilding. I remember you posting about that year when you're like, you know, going through all the stuff and mm. revealing all of the, the spaces. I was like, wow, that's fascinating. And at the same time, we were um, battling the garden that had become overrun. wildly overgrown and overrun. Particularly, there was a, about a 1,000 square meters of bamboo, highly invasive. And oh, wow. How did you get rid of that? Well, we fought it for about five years on our own. Just a saw and an axe to split it, and then we'd burn it or chip or shred it or what have you. And then finally, after five years, we had... I'd say we'd gotten about half of it, maybe not, maybe 40%, where we had reclaimed it. But of course, all the roots remained, which meant that every year, hundreds of sprouts would come back up. So finally, 
two neighbors of ours. One's a landscaper, the other um, does concrete, but they had a couple of excavators and bulldozers. Uh, and they came in and they tore it all up and we fed it into a monstrously big chipper shredder. Mm. And then they, they dug a four meter deep hole. Wow. Buried all that network of uh, roots and stuff because then it's too deep for it to come back. And then on top of it, we built hills called Skiyama. It's a garden feature where they're artificial hills that mimic the hills in the distance and they connect. There are some gardening uh, philosophical design points. And one is you try to take your garden and tie it into the view that you have in the distance. Mm. It's called shakke. It's, it literally means borrowed scenery. So by putting that skiyama there, it drew your eye from the immediate feature to your hills to these hills behind. And we have uh, not seen the bamboo since, which is wonderful. Huh. Well, this marks the end, really, of the Kanto Plains. Once you once you go beyond this town, you're in the foothills, and then you're in the uh, the Japanese Alps. Ah, okay. Oh, this is it. Oh. Oh, oh. What, two buildings. Yeah. So the main house and the earthen storehouse. What is the uh, the roof made out of? Ceramic tile. So did you have to replace all that? No. Thankfully, the family that we bought it from, upon the man's retirement. He re-roofed the entire thing, and uh, tiles are good for about 80 years, so it should, oh, fantastic. should last us. Oh, look at this place. Holy moly. So how was it when it first, when you first, first took over? Was oh. it, it was like this? No. It's really <laughs> grown. And... Well, like the big cherry tree, the big ginkgo tree, the big cedar tree, all the big trees were here. But these smaller ones, like these maples, this cherry, we put those in. Oh. A lot of the shrubs we put in. Wow. And you you laid these too, right? These Yeah, uh, but I'm going to pull these them. Stone? I'm going to extend the driveway that I built. And I've got some big stones in the back. Big stones that I'm going to redo later. Wow. And so these three structures, oh, there's four structures. Mm. One, two, three, four. There's another one behind. Another one in, in the They're all existing. Yep. Yeah. Wow. And they were all built 18, 1890? Thereabouts. These might have been built later, but... No, no, no. Because the the same. that's the original toilet. Right, right. Oh, the toilets were outside. Uh huh. Not when oh. we bought the place, but right, right, but back in the in those <laughs> days. Yep. Was it like a shogun that lived here? Let's get out of the heat. Yeah, put on in. So, do you ever put on like your, uh, I don't know, your uh, what yukata and pretend yukata that I'm and then like walk around the man? Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> you don't do that. Even the gin bear, you don't wear that. And... No. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm more of a, you know, sh slipper and shorts kind of guy. Oh, oh, air conditioning, huh? Yes. <laughs> it, that's unusual. No, no, no. I no? Air conditioning super common in Japan. Maybe in the older houses, though. Oh, here's that slab that you were working on. Oh, I remember that. This is like a whole awakening from, like, YouTube. <laughs> I mean, not from Facebook. Oh, where you from see your the Facebook pieces? Post, like, oh, so that's this. And that's that. <laughs> the tatami you replaced. Yes, the floor. This is. Oh, did you replace the floor? Oh yeah. Down to the. I replaced all the beams. It used to be a. It used to be a packed dirt over here and over there. And okay. then there was this shoddy, shoddy floor where you had to step on the beams, or else your foot would have gone through. Oh really? Oh yeah. So what's the floor now? Well, it's pressure treated two by eights, 40 centimeters or 16 inches on center with uh, three centimeter, what's that, about inch, inch and a quarter, inch and a half, mm -hmm. uh, plywood, tongue and groove. And then the same, these are um, 20 centimeters or eight inches by three centimeters. Again, that's about an inch and a half thick, uh, grooved plank flooring, cedar, Japanese cedar. Oh, nice. Look at the woodwork, the green on that. It's beautiful. Is this the cat? Yep, this yes. is oh. this is the cat. Poor baby. He's doing all right now, but he wasn't doing so good earlier. And he's okay. Come here, buddy. Curious, this, uh, the kitchen, mm -hmm. is that period? No. 
It's well, not, I mean, the, 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 cabinet, stamp, the cabinet that I haven't rebuilt yet, that's this one. This cabinet probably dates from the 70s or 80s. Oh, yeah, so this is not new. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, right. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the stain. The entire frame is stainless steel. Mm -hmm. And that's nice because it's uh, water resistant, obviously. And roaches don't like it. Right. Big plus. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to reface it. And I'm going to do all custom joinery. I have something called Yakusugi. It's cedar from Yakushima. You're not allowed to harvest it anymore. But anything that was pre-felled beyond a certain year, you could buy it. Oh, okay. And we stayed at a small ryokan. I got to know the proprietor, who was another woodworker. We talked wood, and I wound up with a slab oh. of it. So I'm going to do some floating panels, rail and style, and do some dovetail drawers and like. So this will be refaced in wood. Okay, but you'll keep the counter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, the stainless counter is dead convenient. Oh, a nice big basin too. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And then I put in the gas oven. That's a commercial unit. Oh, nice. Like and for a restaurant here. Yep. Good for walk as well. Yeah, yeah, it's got plenty. It's got plenty of fire. And then... How about the hood? The hood is existing? The hood is existing, but I've cleaned it up and reinstalled it. Nice. And then um, this I bought about half a year ago as a stand for our sort of toaster oven microwave range. So this is toaster and microwave? Yeah, it's, it's all all in one. Wow. I didn't really made something like that. Okay. Yeah, it's nice. And then this... These used to be vertical like this. And what I did was I put them back to back and then built this countertop out of Japanese elm. And this elm came from my school. We were doing a renovation. There was a long four meter long bar welcoming people in the, in the foyer, you know, where they would be like, you check in and some books and things. They were gonna throw it away. They were going to throw it away. Yeah, they were going to throw it away. God, this thing's the... epic. This is four inches, you said? Yeah, about that. Look at that craziness. And the bow tie joints. But, so I, I put all that in. Oh, you did these. Okay. So basically, you're looking at about this. And, and then it was about this wide total. So I cut it down by half, ripped off some pieces that I used for the legs, and then joined it and put the bow ties in to prevent, you know, checking, and then refinished it. But you know, so it was only this wide originally, but twice as long, right? And the, so this is the other end of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wow. you, this is the center point, and then if you imagine adding this in between the two, mm. you get a sense of what it was. Hmm. This is epic. This is beautiful. I love the color too. The yeah, stand. yeah, and well, it's the same kind of wood as the main beam of the house. Oh, okay. The Japanese elm, and then these cabinets. This one came with the house. Uh, this one I purchased, I don't know, three or four years, but when we were living in Kawasaki, actually. Do you find these like, at, uh, I don't know, like, are there antique shops for this there kind of stuff? There are antique shops. Um, I generally find stuff online, whether at auction or you just, you know, search in Japanese. Okay. And then... Um, Oh yeah. wow, that's epic too. Look so that, that's what we used to, well that's what I used to grind our coffee. Like still today? Yeah. Did that come with the house? No, no, I bought that. Oh, you bought that, okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. And then this is something called a horigotatsu. So, you know, kotatsu is the table with the blanket and the heating unit. Okay. And hori means moat. So a horigotatsu is one where you can put your feet down in. Oh. Ah, honto, okay. Because yeah. you don't, you know, at my age anyway, you don't want to sit cross-legged very much. Yeah, yeah, I, that's that's a detriment to me as well. It's like, I don't want to do that. And then this table is made from ipe, and that's um, leftover wood from our deck in Hawaii. I took it with us and built a table from it. You just brought this big piece of wood from Hawaii here? Well, same as the table there. Oh. It's also from Hawaii. We we rented, I don't know if it was a 20-foot or 40-foot, but it was a Matson container. Okay. And we put all our stuff in it. Wait, wait, what's going on here, though? Oh, so that's a hibachi um, a brazier. And a friend of a friend was getting rid of it. Her mother had been given it as a gift. It was a custom-made piece, probably in the early 1900s. Right. And they wanted to get rid of it. They were going to throw it away. And a friend of a friend knew that I had this house and thought that it might sort of fit the house. 
Yeah. So he connected us with that other person. Uh, she lived in Yokohama, and I wound up picking it up. So this still works? Oh yeah, no, dude, it's it's all. And you still use it? Yeah. So if you look in here, there's water. Whoa. Okay. Ooh. And what you do is, you under here, you put charcoal, and the charcoal in that basket over there. So okay. You, you put that charcoal under here, and you light and, it. And it, yeah, and then it heats all of the water here. So you can see the fire would be there. Right, right. And you can, you know, directly heat the pot, the pot if you want. Or you put the water in here, and then what you do is you put your sake bottles in here. And that heats it gently, but never allows it to get too hot. So you, if you want to have your warm sake on a cold winter night, it's a nice way to drink But it. you could also use this for tea? Yeah, for tea. You can also toast rice, you know, like mochi. You can do that here. Toast rice? Oh, uh, rice cake, you know, mochi. Yeah, you yeah. toast that on what? On just... On you put a, you just, you would take this tea kettle off. Mm -hmm. You would put a little gr grill, like a oh. mesh uh, on it. Uh, uh -huh. And then just put it on and, and it toasts up. It's lovely. Oh, wow. And then what is this apparatus? This is called the Jizai Kagi. It is a hearth hook. So you can adjust it. And then if I move the brazier here, I can hang a pot, like a nabe pot. And then I could do, I could do a, a nabe with chicken and noodles and just have it simmer. And it's adjustable. Wow. Now is there a... Look at the way that adjusts. That's wild. Now, is there any thoughts about like, if, you, if you're burning mm -hmm. fuel, mm -hmm. such as the, about carbon monoxide? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, you, you, we have CO monitors in the house though. But I mean, do you just like open the windows or how does that? Yeah, you crack the window a little bit. Oh, okay. Dude, the house is 135 years, 100 and, yeah, 133 years old now. So I don't worry about ventilation. It, it's, <laughs> the oh, house okay. is ventilated. Now, but was this, this, this item, was this here with the house? Well, the Horigotatsu was here, okay. but I purchased this in Fukuoka. This is uh, Edo period. This, this is probably, I don't know, two, three hundred years old. This piece. Wow. It's wow, actually, okay. it's actually um, brass, but it's darkened from charcoal years. smoke over the years. But I mean, what I'm saying is, like, I guess what I'm leading up to is, like, if the families were, that were here were using this kind of charcoal burner, mm. was there evidence of that yeah, so not in here. the room? Or? Um, the house, by the time we bought it, had undergone a few renovations. And when I did this floor over, because this used to be tatami, right about where the stereo is, there is the remains of a hearth. Again, the house had been rebuilt or modified probably several times in its life. Okay. Uh, and so there wasn't any evidence of the, um, the fire pit, but the, there, under, I've kept it. Underneath here, there is the, the rock base of the hearth. Ah. Was there any soot or... Not no. that I could see, but okay. again, they probably abandoned that 100 years ago. Gotcha. Be my guess. So let's see. Um, these are single piece of Japanese elm. And they're quite heavy, but a lovely set of four doors. They slide, mm. as you can see, but four panels. And that's one solid piece. So you figure the tree that it would have come from would have had a diameter of about that. It's that kind of wood. This is another example. If you look at this beam, so my hand is 20 centimeters or about eight inches. That gives you an idea of just how big this is. Yeah. You can't buy fresh timber in this size easily anymore. So the house is built of materials and like, you know, this rabbit, this is cut by hand 133 years ago. All, all of this is cut by hand. Now with, with these doors closing and these, how uh, well isolated is this room become for your music? Oh, not. Oh, not, okay. Yeah, if I, you know, th right now this is very quiet. But when I want to listen to music at, at sort of concert level, Kimberly will get to enjoy whatever I listen to as well. From the storehouse. Yeah, yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> but um, I mean, I, I mean, as acoustically for you to listen to music. Oh, well, here. Like, are you... Have a seat. Hold on, I'll give you a, a sample. There's a... Um, there's a I mean, does it give you the results you desire? Yeah, 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 okay. absolutely. 
you know, I haven't done acoustic treatment on the room. You notice I don't have any sound absorbing right. panels, but that's because I don't have any walls. And, and as a result, huh. you know, you don't need to, as long as you keep it open. But I'll try to give you an idea. And these are rice paper? Is that right? Uh, well, they're, they're paper, Japanese paper. They're made from, well, traditionally, the paper's made from mulberry, but oh, okay. I, I think uh, mulberry bark, I think it is. And but the rice is the glue. Oh, the rice is the glue. Mm -hmm. Ah. Are you more of a jazz guy? Yeah. Well, jazz and metal. Kind of oh. both of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see how they go together. Have you heard the new ACDC? No, I haven't. Is that too rock? It's kind of like the 80s. And you've got a nice subwoofer, I see. That's... Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. This is my... Sort of my small set. I've got a bigger set of speakers I built 20 years ago. They used massive 15 inch midwoofers, but they'd be too loud, mm. you know, for what they can do. Do you find that has better clarity or this has better clarity? That used a special constant directivity horn for the mid and treble area. And, and therefore it was really good, is really good. But I can't resist playing it at concert levels. So what I'm going to do is when I rebuild the storehouse, it's got almost two foot thick walls. Oh. Earth. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, Waddle and dog. So the first floor will be my wood shop. The second floor will be an audio listening room because then I won't bother the neighbors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or the wife. Here you can bother the neighbors. Oh, yeah. And so this is Kimberly's office. And I, as I was telling you, I like uh, Art Nouveau, so those are just reproduction prints. And I made the frames out of koa. Nice. So was that from the time you lived in Hawaii? Yeah. Okay. I brought a lot of koa, uh, koa, kamani, a few other woods, some mango with us. Uh, and then watch your head. What about the desk? So this desk came with the house, but it was, it was left outside and was in horrible shape. I literally took, tore it entirely apart, refinished it, put it back together. Oh. And then recently, I felled an oak tree on our property. I've ripped it using an Alaska mill. It's going to season for about a year. And then I'll run it through a thickness planer, turn it into planks, and I'm intending to actually box in the desk. Oh, okay. And build some new drawers. Can you see the drawers are missing? Yes. Yeah. I noticed that. So, Ma, it's an old piece, but it's beautiful old oak. And again, you look, you're probably looking at 25 centimeters. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to find. Okay, again, watch your head. Now this, this feature here between the rooms... It's called Ranma, R-A-N-M-A, transom in English. Okay. And what it allows is privacy in terms of, you can't see through easily, but it allows air to travel between the rooms. So ventilation in a Japanese house is critical. You can do as much insulation as you want, but you need air to flow under the house and you want air to flow between the rooms. As long as you do that, the earthen walls will breathe, the rice mats will breathe, and the house will do a very good job of controlling humidity. Japan's really humid in summer, right? And their houses are built for summer, not for winter. In other words, traditionally, a Japanese house will be really cold in wintertime, but it'll be as comfortable as it can be in summer when it's hot and humid. That's it. Now, and without getting the moldy and mustiness. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We now have the best of both worlds because I've insulated, there's insulation up in the ceiling, down on the floor, uh, double pane glass. So in summer, well you can see it's quite cool. Yes. Uh, and then in winter, toasty. And then this is the main washitsu. Washitsu just means uh, traditional Japanese room. And this is a tokonoma. So as I was telling you, the tokonoma will give you an idea of how well built a house is. And this wood is called kurogaki, or black persimmon. And it's persimmon, you know, like the persimmon that you would eat. And a certain small percentage of the wood gets this black veining. It looks a bit like ebony, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and so being built out of that, I knew that it was, you know, 
well constructed. And that's the same thing here with this black. Yes, yes. So this is this the this is all kurogaki. And you can see there's some termite damage that I'm going to need to repair. The termites are actually in in it. No, no, they're, they're they're done and dusted. They were not active when we bought the place, but the damage was probably done 10 years ago. I don't know. Okay. So I'll probably use kurogaki. I have some kurogaki. I'll rip it into maybe a two mil veneer and cover the wood because the joints are so locked in that I would have to tear apart the entire thing to replace this one beam and I'm not going to do that. Right. My uncle or Kimberly's uncle recommended, look, just reface it with kurogaki. So I'll do that. And so what would they use this traditionally for? For, for what you're looking at. This. So you just to have a tapestry? Or yeah, a so you'd put a, this is a kakijiku or kakimono um, scroll. Typically you'd have a scroll, you might have some ikebana, flower arranging. If your family had a warrior caste background, you might have um, yoroi, armor. You might have like a set of armor, you might have a katana set. It depends on what the person wants to show. Ah. Right? But typically a scroll, some flowers, maybe a piece of pottery. So just a place for you to show off something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure if it was like a shrine or meant to be a shrine. No, 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 no. So the shrine is actually over here. The Butsudan, the family shrine. So this is the family shrine. Oh. It came with the house and it actually came with the family name register and things like that. And our neighbors are like, dude, you know, you need to get rid of that. But we felt it was rather cruel. It, they don't bother us. Wait, why, so, do they, why do they say you want to get rid of it? Well, you know, super superstitions about the family, not spirits, not being happy, maybe. So this would be the family's... This is the Hayakawa family's portable temp family shrine. So their, fam their, their ancestor spirits are here. Right. Well, the ashes have been removed, you know, before we came. Uh -huh. uh, and there's a little votive tablet. So that's been removed. But... There's a registry of the family and, and other things. I don't know. We just figured, A, it's a beautiful piece of work. Mm -hmm. uh, B, if you were to get rid of it, it would just either be burnt or thrown away. So not that I think there's an afterlife, but if there was an afterlife, would you rather be burnt and thrown in a dump? Or would you rather be left with some young foreign couple? We figured... That, doesn't, be... that doesn't mind you being with them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So once or twice a year, we open it up. We say, hey, how you doing? Uh, and is that traditional once or twice a year? Or is well, that... yeah, so at certain points in the year during New Year's or during Obon, uh -huh. you would sort of, you know, welcome the family if, if the remains and things or the ash were in there. Okay, so is that a Buddha in there or is that... It is... What is in there? Uh, you'd have to ask somebody who's far more on it. But yeah, that's a Buddhist uh, statue inside. And then there are different candles and the different cakes mean things. I'm not Buddhist. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. And then like sake if to offer. Yeah, exactly. Oh. And this is Shinto, or this is Buddha. Well, Buddhist. it's got a Buddhist thing in it, uh, and Shinto is more animistic. So a rock or a tree or, or a person can you know become a kami, but this would be more of a Buddhist tradition. This one up here is more Shinto. So, so you see for this. This is reminiscent of a Shinto shrine, and the white paper represents like uh, lightning, that, that shape, uh -huh. right? So it's a bit of both. And actually, these boxes here are chochin, uh, lanterns, paper lanterns, and that's the family crest for the Hayakawa, the family that we bought from. Mm. Uh, that's, you know, myoga? It's like, it's like ginger, like shoga, but not quite. It's a kind of ginger okay. in the ginger family. Okay. But Myoga is their family crest. Ah, Myoga. I wonder why Myoga. Well, different families. I would assume Myoga, it, they probably came from an agricultural background. Mm -hmm. back, in, ginger. back in the day, only certain class, like the warrior class, the, 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 the daimyo and the samurai, they could have those crests. But then business people began to get money. money. And they were like, well, screw you. We want crests too. And so they established it. And then you know, now most families have a crest. Oh, okay. Is that, what the, is that the, the family crest that they wear on the shoulder? Yes. Okay. On, on the haori coat or, yeah, or, yeah. or the kimono, depending. Yeah. Uh, and then 
Okay, so in this Japanese, the traditional Japanese room, mm. why do they have it? Or what's the purpose? Well, first, washitsu just means Japanese style room. Okay. So this house would have had one, two, three, four, five, eight Japanese rooms, eight washitsu, eight oh, okay. tatami rooms. This is one of them that we kept. We kept one down here and we kept one up on the second floor because tatami is wonderful. And this is, this is hon tatami, this is the real thing. So this is made with um, material from Kyushu, wada, straw. Is right. that where it's supposed to be from, Kyushu? Well, that's where the, the best okay. tradition they came from. There's not many places that grow it and harvest it anymore. Most of it's imported from China. So uh, this is, and modern houses typically have foam inside wrapped with straw on the outside. But this is wada or straw on the inside and then the proper on the outside. And it's woven. Yes. Oh. Okay, so this is custom made, I imagine? Yes. Uh, each mat. And traditionally, a mat represented one person's sleeping space. Oh. Japanese people were smaller back then. Yes, yes. But roughly one meter by two. Not quite, but roughly one by two. Yeah, when you see like armor from the old eras, they're, oh, yeah. they're, they're super small. Yeah. Hardcore, but short. Yeah. So, you know, theoretically, I think this is 10, if I'm not mistaken. 10. Yeah, 10 mat. So, theoretically, you could have 10 people sleep in here if, if you needed. You wouldn't actually, but this is one of the big rooms. Now, this room would not have been a bedroom. This would have been sort of a formal sitting space. And again, because you've got the tokonoma, you've got an opportunity to express your individual taste and style. Bit of a statement room, uh, but not many people would see it. Only really close friends or very important guests might be invited into this room. Everybody uh, else would be outside of this room. In, usually in the Genkan. The Genkan. Okay. Right, so the Genkan is a pseudo public space. The front door is not typically locked and it represents a space where a salesperson or delivery person could theoretically enter and then announce themselves. Nowadays, they announce themselves outside and you greet them at the Genkan and they could come in that far, but no farther. But back in the day, they might actually enter mm. and say, Gomen kudasai, you know, hello, I'm here. And then, for example, if it was a kimono dealer, they would bring samples of cloth and they would sit down with you. You might have a cup of tea in the Genkan and share. I see. I see. What is the uh, the the slow? Is that a slogan or something? Or ah, um, <laughs> it it means fish. Let me let me get this straight. Plow the clouds, fish the moon, and it's huh. uh, uh, apparently a Zen koan. You know, one of those sort of riddles that you ponder. Mm -hmm. But the calligraphy uh, intrigued us, and so we kept. It came with the house. Mm -hmm. And this is what they had displayed in the house? Yes. In this spot? Yes. Oh. Moon. Yeah. Wait, wait, which is the cloud, sorry? Cloud. Cloud. Plow. Plow. Moon. And fish. fish. And how fish, would you say that? Fish. Right. Well, how would you say that in Japanese? You know, I don't know how... To, when you put the four together, you change the... You change the reading, but, you know, uh -huh. kumo and getsu and tsuri, for example, you know, would be individual readings, but how they're said when they're together... Mm. Oh, it may, may totally change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, I see, okay. So, for example, there's an, a business expression, nenkyu muchu, which means th th 365, you know, no, no clothes. Nen can also be read toshi. Chu can be read naka. Mu can be read nai. Kyu uh, can be read yasumu. So, when you put them together, nenkyu muchu becomes a a short phrase, and those four character phrases are not slogans, but expressions, a bit like um, maybe some of our expressions, like um, two birds, one stone, mm, mm. that sort of expression. Ah. Yeah. And then looking out from here, this is called uh, an engawa. Engawa is... Oh, this, this part the, around the, here. Yeah. It can also be called roka, but basically it's a, it's not a deck. But it's, this is inside the house. This is a transitionary space and it leads out to the garden. Now, traditionally, you wouldn't have glass here. Instead, you would just have 
these paper doors. When oh, and was, you just have the soffit, that'd be it. Exactly, so when it was first built, you'd have these doors here, and you'd have another set of shoji doors here. Oh, another, okay. And then- and these out, are shoji doors, these yeah. are called shoji, okay. And then outside of that, you would have wooden doors kept off to the side called amado, storm doors, rain doors. Oh, well, for bad weather. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so what would happen is you would close those, which would of course make the house dark as, because they're solid wood. Right. And then once the storm went, you know, you'd put them to the side and you'd have the paper. It's a sheet of paper between you and the outside, hence the pretty cold in winter. By the time we bought the house, that had been taken out. They had aluminum a framed single pane sliding glass doors. Mm. But I wanted wood because I don't like aluminum. It fits the house better, I think. Yeah, wood. yeah, I can. It sounds, it doesn't sound pretty. Right. Uh, and then double glass. Uh, is it nitrogen or argon? I think it's argon filled. Oh, okay. But so it's got a pretty good uh, refractive. Or... And then so these are the these are the modern doors. Mm -hmm. What are these up here? So those are the original um, transom glass, single glass, and you can see the light. You can see oh, that there are gaps. Little bleed, yeah. Right. So the next step in my project is to rebuild these with double glass. Oh, you're gonna replace them, okay? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, you can see the gap right there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So you were asking me, do I worry about carbon monoxide? No. Not at this point, no. <laughs> and then if you look from here out, so this, the, again, the big trees were all here, but this dry pond is called Karisansui. That's where you build a waterfall or a pond that will never hold water, but you use stones and gravel to imply water. Oh. So I built this one first. I dug out the hole um, and then most- Oh, this was not pre-existing. No, no. And then most of these stones were given to me. And I know a landscaper who was trained in Kyoto. And I gave him an idea of what I wanted. I, I was like, I, I want this big stone here and that, and I want it to look like a waterfall and I want a stone bridge. And so after consulting with me, we came up with a design and he brought his team of two or three people with some heavy equipment and then built this. But then two years later, I had an opportunity to get even more stone for free. All of that stone was given to me. Oh, I remember when you were placing that stone. And so this was built, I don't know, two, three months ago. And what I wanted was to connect. So remember I was telling you about shake, where you have levels Right, you're of, connecting to the the and so in this case, I wanted to connect the foreground with a background. And so they, they just recently built that and I put in all the, the plants just mm, two, three weeks ago. So is that to say the connection of of this, yes. the, the, this is, the foreground. is tied to that? To that. Not to the mountains. No, that, that we, you'll see that when we go outside. Okay. That's a different view. And then the last stage, because right now you've got a dry waterfall there, a dry waterfall here, but they're, they're not connected. So what I want to do is connect them and have a piece come in here and then throw a stone bridge over them, but that's later in life. And the lantern, the big black stone lantern, that I bought, but from a local stone shop. And that stone is actually from the south of Japan, a town called Yame. Uh. Really ni nice stone. But you can picture, you know, you sit here, and you have yourself a cup of tea. And you look out. And you just see the... In fact, here, if you sit here, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So that's the view if you sit there. But if you sit here, this is the east. You can look out to the west and see the Tsukiyama. Or you look, you can look to the south and see the waterfall. Yeah, yeah, swing around here, you'll here. see exactly what I mean. So here you've got two different views. To the west, you're looking at currently, mm -hmm. and you can see the first of the Tsukiyama, the, the low hill that's about, uh, what, 20 meters from us? Okay. Or you can look south, this way, and then you see the garden. Oh, fantastic. And you get to watch the light play and change throughout the day. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's really quite nice. Just sitting here all day drinking tea. That's a great idea. Play cards, have lunch, you know. It's yeah. nice. Now, what are, here in this, I'm curious about this uh, 
this detail with the wood. Mm. So first you can tell it's old, right? Mm -hmm. The glass is so old, it's really hard to clean. I, I'd like to get it back to being dead clear, but this wood, it's a certain style. It's a, it's like a transom. It's like this Ranma, but it's been glassed in because it's facing outside. I'd have to pop the frame apart and clean the glass really thoroughly and put it back together. And that's, that's a project mm. that I'm not willing to take on just, just yet. yet. But eventually. Gotcha. But these are just decorative. Random, random with it. Yep, just gotcha. decorative. Now with these, what do they, what do you call these doors again? Sorry. Well, so these are shoji. Shoji. Right. And then these are suma. If you, here, step back a minute. I'll show you. I'll come, come in here. Oh, full scenery. Nice. So, fusuma come in many different patterns. Some of them are just geometric patterns or just plain paper, for example, yeah, woven, but still. But this one has, um, you know, artwork that's been done on it. And there, do you know the sake brand Shochikubai? Shochikubai, Shochikubai yes. So, Shochikubai means pine bamboo, plum. And those three together represent fortune or good luck or something like that. Okay. And so if you look, you'll often see sho chiku bai. So there's the bamboo. There is the plum, uh, mm. but it doesn't have the, uh, the, bai. See, the, the sho, the, oh, the, 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 the pine. But on the opposite side, we have, so you, you can see. So on the flip side, we have the pine. The pine. Ah. And so we've got plum on that side and pine on the oh, side. Oh, nice. Now with these, with these other ones that have the framing, I've noticed that there's only one side has frames. Correct. Is so, that how they always are? Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're, they're, they're paper right. used with rice glue. And what you need to be able to do is, you're supposed to do it once a year, but we have like 30 of these things, you can imagine. Um, what you do is you, you pop them out, lay them on the ground, spray them with water, that releases the rice glue. Oh, right. And literally it's rice glue. You can take rice. Yeah, and just rub it And off. just rub it until it becomes a paste. Uh, take off the stuff, sort of scrape down the old glue, get it clean, and then put down a new layer of rice glue, put the paper on, let it dry, and then hit it with a very fine mist. And what that does is it tightens the paper and it becomes like a drum skin. Mm. But you could imagine if it was framed on both sides. Right, it'd be difficult. To get right? Down. So that's why typically. I just never have seen, I've just never seen the doors from both sides. Mm -mm -mm. You know, you usually see them on shows where you yeah. only see this side. Yeah, well, you can see what it looks like on this side. So if you you would you would buy this paper? Yeah, they sell it at any home center. So it's not terribly expensive. No. No. Oh, okay. It's just time consuming. I suppose you could yes, probably yes. find some super rare paper made from virgin silkworm chewing. I I don't know, but but you haven't. No. Well, I'm surprised. Typically, well, <laughs> this 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 paper is quite lovely, and remember, you're replacing it once a year. Yeah, well, so have you been? We're, we're no, are you kidding me? <laughs> we did it once. I it's, it's, like, uh, can you do other colors then, or is it? Is there, are they available? You, well, some of them have patterns. Yeah. So, for example, you might have um, bamboo leaves <clears throat> scattered through. There is colors, usually it's pastels. Very, yeah, like pink. Very light. Because the idea is that it should be somewhat translucent. You should have some light coming through it rather than... Theoretically, you could put thick, dark, heavy paper on there, mm. but then you'd get no light. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So you, if you had colors and you had household staff, you could have them do it on a seasonal basis. Mm -hmm. Sure, if you were crazy wealthy and you wanted them to change out the paper. But the Japanese have a philosophy of multi nai, so don't waste. Mm. And you'd be hard pressed to justify swapping paper out seasonally for fashion. Hmm. And in fact, traditionally, I think you're supposed to change it out once a year, but what most families did, if they got, for example, a puka, a pole mm -hmm. in the paper, 
they would use more paper with a bit of rice glue and they'd make a, a patch. Oh, right, right. And sometimes like in the shape of a bunny or a cat paw or yeah, we've whatever. We've got a couple like that in the utility room yeah. door. Oh, okay. All right, I'm well, going to go upstairs. Well, that's right, there's an upstairs. Do you guys still live upstairs too or? My office is upstairs. Oh, your office is upstairs. I have to move this staircase. Ooh, I like the finish of the flooring. The treads are quite high. Yes. Yeah, that, that would not pass your standard pitch for a stair. <laughs> you can tell that there's a little bit of a difference in the heat. Up Absolutely. Here. Absolutely. Ooh. So I built this desk uh, in 2014. Fantastic looking. So Japanese elm. Okay. And it's built without any nails or glue. So do you see these pins? Hmm. Oh, oh. So you can see. Yes. And so these fit into slots like here and here, and it locks it in place. Oh. Wow. So theoretically, you're, you're, I could flat pack, you know, and take it all apart. And then ship it somewhere. Right. What are you using for a machine? Uh, well, table saws. And no, I mean your Mac. Oh, it's the Mac Mini. The M1? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then built this with the leftover pieces from this. Built nice. the frame. And then this is American Walnut. And this is Paduk on the handles. Is that from previous, you built that years ago or is that something? No, no, no. So, I, well, I built it in 2014. Oh, 2014. Okay. Yeah. And then let's see what else. What's this, this same thing as downstairs? Yeah, or? basic, same idea. So this is um, a haori coat. It's um, like a half the length of a kimono. And we just have it on, you know, for display. Is this what they call the happy coat as well? Or? Happy coat is different. Different, okay. But same basic idea. Okay. And let's see what when else. When would one wear the howdy coat? Well, semi-formal. Okay. Right. Just meant to be open like that on... Yeah, there's a, there's a, a little... Belt's the wrong word. The ebi? It, well, the, the, the obi goes around. The obi, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is like, um, almost like a watch fob. But it hooks two sides. On on the inside, there's a oh. little there's a ooh, there's a little hook here, and so you would just hook it, and it would hold it together. But open. yes, yes, right. I, I'm familiar. With, I'm familiar with what we're talking about. Yes. But that might go, for example, over uh, um, an inner longer garment, like a kimono. Yeah, yeah, like like that. Not kimono proper, but yeah. And then oh. this ceiling's quite rare. It's. Called Chine, in, in Japanese, they, they call it the Chinese style roof. And um, what's interesting is above this, so these beams you see here mm -hmm. are also above here. Oh, okay. And then hanging down from them are skinny sticks, which then attach to the frame that holds this up. It's a drop ceiling, 1890 style. Wow. Which is cool, but when I needed to go up there and put an in insulation, this would not support my weight. Oh, I, this is the one where you were crawling around. I remember that, okay. Yes. Ah. And then here, another Japanese room. Another tokonoma. Oh, no. Again, with uh, kurogaki. And this is a solid sheet of wood. It's quite lovely. Yeah, that's fantastic. So these are just like places for to display. Yep. Okay. Mind you, when we bought the place, um, somebody had set up an office desk in there. Oh. Not particularly attractive. But. Mm. And then here, I'll shut these doors so you can get a sense. This is usually where we put our guests. If they're staying overnight, we'll, we'll bring out a futon mm -hmm. for them, and then they'll stay here. Where do you keep the futon? In the closet. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so here you've got cranes. They're a symbol of longevity. You've got the plum. pine and the plum and the bamboo. So oh, then yeah, the you've bamboo. got your shochikubai going on there. Oh, nice. And then reindeer. Or yeah. And you change those out seasonally. Oh, these are changed seasonally? Yep. Okay. 
Oh, that lamp is cool too. So this came with the house, but it had plastic inside. We took the plastic out and Kimberly repapered it. Oh, that looks great. Nice, because it's paper. So, you know, if it gets dirty or whatever, we can always repaper it as yeah, we yeah. need. Oh, and look, you, a, young, a young couple. Yeah, younger. Anyway, that's not our wedding picture, but it's from a good friend of ours. Oh, no, I got your wedding picture. About 20 years ago, I guess. Yeah, yeah. you know the wedding picture. I got picture. your wedding picture. <laughs> With the hair down to here. <laughs> and that wasn't Kimberly's hair down to here. <laughs> <laughs> Her hair was longer than mine. Yeah, well, yeah, but you had, you had the mullet, the 80s oh, mullet. For, for sure, dude. <laughs> I was totally rocking the mullet. I was like, who's this metal guy that she's marrying? What is going on? The craziness. And then here we have uh, some pheasants. Oh. Is there symbolism to the pheasant? Not that I know of. Okay. Sometimes you just see some hawks and other birds might, you know, appear in the motif. And then this is another ranma. This didn't, it wasn't originally with the house. So oh, it wasn't. Okay. I wanted to open up the house, so I tore out this wall. It used to be like that wall. Okay. And then I put that on my to display. I picked that up in Kyoto, actually. That's a great one, ma. Pretty, yeah. That's plum. Now on here with the walls, like what are they made of? Well, what's the material? It looks like there's some kind of plaster. Yeah. So there's typical uh, framing behind them, and there's insulation, and that's sheetrock. Oh. Now on top of that, you could do plaster, right? If you wanted to, or right. whatever you wanted to do. But was it? What was it originally? Originally, it was like this. There was no. There was nothing. Well, not there. There was nothing there. Oh, it was just open. Yeah. So oh, the, you just filled that all in. Because the floor went across up here. Oh, right. This was all floored in. So I tore the floor out. Because you said this is oh, your storage me. area. Yeah, sorry. Well, flo up here it would be a floor. But we didn't right. have access to this area. Gotcha. So this was all just dead space. But I wanted to show off the beams because they're so lovely. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then what about this doorway here or whatever that... I built that when I built the wall. Okay. So I need access in. What's in there? Story. Insulation, insulation, wiring. Oh, okay, okay. Stuff like that. Oh. And then you replace these as well? Yes. So these beautiful, are the beautiful. same. And they, before they didn't open. Um, they were glass, but they didn't open. So now with this oh, unit, yeah, can... in, in the morning, we'll open it up and let the breeze flow oh, through. that's beautiful. When you come down, watch your step. It's definitely steep. Feel oh, yeah. free to, you know, put your hand here. I will before I bust my ass into that glass. Oh, no, it's not that bad. No, you get used to it, but still. It's not that bad. Yeah, it can bite you. <laughs> and then I can take Yana to her outside. Sounds good. Let and me grab a... I'll, from inside the house, you know, I told you about building this dry pond. And these stones are interesting. These came from a water wheel. Oh. So there was a rice dealer, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes that way. The river used to run differently. And when it ran by his house, this granite formed the frame for the water wheel that powered their rice mill. But then in the 1960s, the city, for whatever reason, decided to repower or rerun the river route. And as a result, their water wheel dried up. Oh. And so they took apart the frame and everything. And this sat outside their house for 50 years. And I drove by this pile of stone over and over and over the first few years we lived here. And it wasn't going anywhere. So I went with a local neighbor, because, you know, locals and introduced myself and they knew of us from working on the house and I said hey do, you know would you be willing to get up off that stone and he goes oh you can have it all so he gave it to us you and, just had to move it yeah and so got a beautiful stone bridge out of the deal and now how difficult was it to move the well, stone well the the people I know have like two ton cranes oh, so okay. they they picked it up and moved it for me oh that's great The peach? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If we're lucky. Yeah, I can see some of them. I have a small peach tree. It's not this successful. Well, oh, I noticed that yours, your peach tree also leans. Huh? My mom has one. It leans, too. Well, this is a secondary growth. If you look, you'll see there was a much older, thicker one, and it was cut. And then this 
would have been a secondary growth that came up oh. and has regrown. Okay. And this is our cherry tree. Does it's it under produce? Attack. It's under attack right now oh. from um, an invasive Chinese beetle, unfortunately, and it'll probably die. But um, is there a way to combat that? No. In fact, Japan is at risk of losing all of its cherries, plums, and peaches. From that same plant? From yeah, from that bug. Wow. So a Japanese boring beetle will lay, I don't know, 10 or 20 eggs. The Chinese lays over 200 at one go, and they just mob the tree, and it, it can't survive. Wow. And these are all loquats, you said? These are, these are plums, these are plums Japanese these are plums, plums oh. from this tree here. You can see them up in the tree still. Oh, yeah, up way, way up, way up high. Yeah. They don't taste, the flesh is a bit mealy, so they don't taste good as sort of like eating a typical plum, but they taste really good as a jam. They make a really good liqueur, mm. that kind of thing. I guess it's hard to manage them, huh? Yeah, well, yes. you know, you just let them fall, <laughs> rake them up, let them mulch. Uh, what else do we have here? We have um, white you gardenia. Said the, I like white gardenia. Uh, oh, that little shrub down there? We have mm -hmm. tsubaki, we have ajisai or hydrangea with the purple bluish flowers. Oh. Kimberly's walking towards the yuzu tree. Oh yeah, let's see this yuzu. Yuzu come into season in terms of harvest around winter. December. Yeah. Oh really, December? Check out the thorns. Oh, they have thorns. And then this is uh, Savasubedi, or a monkey slip, monkey slide, uh, but it's a crepe myrtle in English. But I love the shape of it. Yeah, you know, it's fantastic. Pretty, pretty funky. Are you doing the supports as well? Mm -hmm. I need to re-wrap re it, but yeah. And these are all biwa. We'll yeah, so some. this fruit are loquat. That's loquat, wow. Yeah, quite tasty. So none of these stones were here, um, and this well, this well portion was here, but this used to be just an ugly concrete slab. Oh. So I tore it out, and then I built and moved these stones into place by hand, and then infilled with a little soil, and this is a kind of thyme. And once I had that, then I approached one of the landscaping friends I have and said, look, I want to design it with a lantern and some big stones. And so they brought in a four-ton crane and lowered these into place. How did you transport these here? Well, the crane loaded it onto the back of like a dump truck. And they drove it over yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah, yeah. craned it again. Yep. Wow, that's amazing. That's and amazing. this is a kinmokuze or um, osmanthus. So huh. when it comes in, they're teeny, teeny little orange and white flowers that smell amazing. Another ajisai. These are all camellia. Um, that's a Japanese pomegranate. Does it produce big pomegranates like that? Or? No, they're, they're about that big. Okay. Not the California size. And then none of the stones were here. We had those brought in. None of these plants were here. I've done all the planting, all the trees. That green maple we grew from a seed. Oh, fantastic. And actually, all of the maples, except the one big one, we've grown from seed. This is another one we grew from seed. And that's a Nanking cherry, which is a tasty small cherry. Which one, sorry? This one. The short over Just, just finished uh -huh. harvesting it. Beautiful flowers in spring and, and tasty fruit. Oh. Chinese trumpets. And then we've got blueberries here. Just a couple of them. You'd think that it would never snow here with this kind of production. It, it actually doesn't, doesn't snow, much. snow much. Oh, it doesn't snow much. It gets much cold, here. minus five. Okay. But it doesn't snow much. Because um, I don't know if I, I don't know if a lot of this would grow in Maryland. So we've got white birch. Yeah, probably, because we're about the same latitude I've... as Los Angeles. Okay. Uh, this is the mulch you said? Th this is uh, white birch. Birch. This is Japanese weeping willow. Weeping willow. This is persimmon, sweet persimmon. Ah. So you remember I told you kurogaki, that wood? Mm -hmm. This wood, this tree might, in the core, have that dark wood. Might. Mm. Oh yeah, look at the little baby persimmons. Excellent. And then raspberries. How oh, raspberries. raspberries. Oh. Then we pick some every day. Mmm. Oh, sheep. <laughs> this is the driveway that Paul laid. So nice. this was originally just grass and gravel. Tore it out, laid a crushed stone foundation, and then moved each of these in place by hand. And you can see 
how big this one is. Right, and right. it's it's about that thick. Oh wow, really? These are massively thick big stones. What and I used uh -huh. I used bamboo as rollers and a big iron bar as a lever and just rolled them and then used leverage to put them in place. And you did this all by yourself? Mm-hmm. What were they before? Well, I mean, the, I mean, what, these, what, what, what did the stones come from that were they using them? Some of them were on property, but most of them came from neighbors who just had them stacked around. Oh. So I would just go up and say, hey, listen, I see you've had this stone in place for five years. It's not going anywhere. Do you have any plans? And they said, no. Oh, okay, well, you know, would you be open to me buying them? And nine times they're like, no, but you can have them. Oh. So your neighbors are pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. I see these guys have relatively modern homes. Yeah, well, these were built two years ago. Oh, just recent, okay. Yeah. These are two different kinds of American cherry. They, they produce cherries that look like Rainier is the closest, rather than Bing. Okay. But two different varieties. One's Hollywood, and I forget what the other one is. When do they normally come in? Uh, a month ago. Oh, a month ago, okay. Yep. And you have to have the two varieties. They need to cross-pollinate for... Um, for fruit to happen, otherwise you can't get any. And the oh, same with our apples. So this is Akibai, Akibai and Sugaru apples. But if you don't have two different kinds, you won't get fruit. But as you can see, oh. we've got- Is that really, true with most apples? I think it's true for many varieties. I, I can't speak for US, variety. I don't know them. Right. Um, but as you can see, we have heaps of apple coming in and Kimberly trimmed, she probably took off half of the apples that were here. Oh yeah, look at that. They're Getting not ready for another month or two. Get in there. Get in there. And then this is a Japanese elm. So all that tabletop and all that stuff that I made, Japanese elm, comes from this. This was a seed. Oh. We raised this from a seed. We kept it in a pot for about seven years before we had, no, maybe three or four years. And then we bought this place. We put it in the ground. It's been in the ground for seven years. So it's about 10 years old altogether. And it'll grow to be massive. It, it'll grow to be 15, 20 meters tall. And theoretically, if it's never cut down, it'll grow this big in girth. <laughs> and you'll get some more timbers for this thing. Yeah, yeah, if I live to be 200. But I would never cut her down. Um, Keaki can live hundreds and hundreds of years. They're very strong, deep roots, and, and quite lovely. And Kimberly's vegetable garden. So we've got, you know, tomatoes, rosemary, oregano, some... Um, Oh, your tomatoes are already coming in. Look yeah, at that. Yep. When did you plant the tomatoes? Hmm, maybe a month ago. And they're already bearing fruit? Yes. Yeah. I'm such a bad person at this gardening thing. <laughs> Me too. It just... We're learning. Yeah. I started last year and I didn't get fruit till September. She got turned on to this no dig, no till gardening style from a fella out of the UK. She subscribes. What to does this. that mean? No till, no dig? What? So it means exactly I what you hear. I don't dig it up. I just put stuff on top and then plant again. Compost. You just put everything on top? So I, that's our, one of our compost piles. Okay. So I pull the compost out, plop it on top, and then I plant the next thing. You don't even dig a hole for the plant? Just for the seed. Yeah. Okay. Like a tiny little hole and that's it. The huh? idea is that you're not disturbing the network of fungus and critters and bacteria that maintain healthy soil. Okay. And by covering it, you know, that's how you do your, your weed suppression. And it's supposed to produce, the, the guy she watches, what's his name? Charles Dowding. Charles Dowding. He, you know, he's pretty scientific in his approach. It's what I appreciate. So he, he does one plot with traditional tilling, one without, and he compares, what's the yield? And he does all sorts of experiments like that. So if you're into sort of evidence-based gardening techniques. It's a neat channel to watch. And so he gets better results with this kind of process than... Mm -hmm. yep. it's, just, it's a lot easier right. than having to like get a tiller. And... and you'll see that we don't have a lawn per se, and we've got some grass, but we also have clover and you know 18 different kinds of weeds. And we do that for two reasons. One, I'm not prepared to do the chemical uh, processing you need to keep a proper fresh green lawn uh, and two the monoculture is not good for the ground so this is all natural we have um, moles and voles they dig up and make you know a mess of this place but if you dig into the soil you'll see tons and tons of earthworms it's really really healthy uh, we've got uh, Japanese tree frogs we've got all sorts of insects 
heaps and heaps of pollinators come, bees and other stuff throughout the year. So you'll note a few things. One, the, the lawn's not completely flat. There are swales right. and, and motion, and we've got different types of greens, including lots of weeds. It took me a long time to come to peace with that. You know, I come from the East Coast. Yeah, yeah. When Your lawn America, is flat, it's yeah. green, it's perfect. Uh, but this is far healthier. So we've got frogs and snakes and all sorts of animals that come in, and it's a direct result of not using pesticides, except when you absolutely have to, like, you know, something's about to die. Mm. Not using herbicides, you know. It's more labor-intensive, i will be honest with you. What, this is? Oh, yeah. Because you're, you're mowing, you're picking, you know, rather than just spraying with chemicals. Oh, so you are actually actually picking stuff out. Yeah, we pick stuff some, but okay. most of it we just mow at a certain level. Oh, okay, okay. It'd be nice, you know, I'll admit, I see this, you know, and East Coast Paul is like, yeah, lawn, but I've, I'm, I'm coming to terms with it. I can, actually, I, you know, I never, like, I'm from that world, like, beautiful lawn, like, there was a time when I was obsessed with doing a nice yeah. lawn, but I never noticed the unevenness of your lawn, per se, because it seems congruent with the location. Sure, sure, sure. Right, if we're Beverly Hills, you know, maybe yeah. there's something to be said, but... And of course, you know, it is kept. You're not wandering through waist-high things. We do keep it mowed, and it's clearly tended, but it's definitely more casual, sort of ramshackle countryside. Yeah, yeah. Now we're in the countryside, so yeah. that, that's apropos, I think. Well, that's countryside as a city of 127,000 can be. So You'd never guess that, though. What's that? What two people can do on a weekend. <laughs> what kind of bike do you have? I have a Suzuki TL1000, basically a Japanese version of a Ducati. I had a Ducati in Hawaii. I liked it. It's gorgeous. It sounded great. It handled like a charm. But I'd swear it broke every other week. I spent more time wrenching on it than I did riding it. Are they that fickle, Ducatis? Yeah, an Italian brand. They're beautiful bikes. I still lust after them every time I see them. I used to ride the... Um, GSX 1100. Good God. Yeah, that was back in, back in Hawaii when we lived there. That, that's, so this tree we bought as a Christmas tree 10, 12 years ago. Yeah. Kept it in a pot for a while. Uh, and then. How big was it in the pot? It was probably diameter, about an inch, and it was as tall as me. Okay. And so just, you know, for scale. <laughs> it's grown a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it looks great. It looks great. <laughs> and then everything you see here, literally from this point all the way up to this wall, was solid, impenetrable bamboo. You wouldn't have seen wow, really? past it. All the way to the, well, I guess the property lens right there yep. with the berm? Okay. Yep. Beyond the berm. Just beyond the berm. So all the way to the property, all the way to the road, was solid bamboo, two different kinds. And you tried to hack that by hand at we first, did, right? We did, for wow. five years. And so you knocked it all down? We knocked down half. Wow. And then the, the remaining core, we just said, you know, we could keep fighting this literally for the rest of our lives, or we can bring somebody in. You couldn't just kill it? No, no. Like I with, mean, like, poisons? I suppose we could have tried that, but, we, we, you know, we're trying not to use chemicals. And right. By killing that, we would have killed everything. Mm. So we weren't done with that. Now here, you can see, this is trying to come back. This is from the bamboo because these trees were here inside the bamboo grove. We couldn't get rid of all of the roots. So I'll come and I'll pop this later and get rid of it. Just pull it out by hand, you mean? Yeah, or you can hit it with some um, herbicide because it's just that. Okay. And so maybe two more years, we should not even have that happening anymore. Yeah, but you can see some of the old cones. Oh yeah, like right there. Yeah, here's one awesome. here. Oh, there we go. That's some mushrooms. Yeah, and so the, you know. Are the these edible? No. Oh. <laughs> the, the bamboo would have been about that thick around. It's big. Wow. But that chestnut tree was almost drowned in the bamboo. Oh, this one right here? Yeah, so the bamboo went all the way out there. Wow. And it was just a skinny little unhealthy tree. And, and these two oak trees had no growth on this side of the tree. And you can see that they had this problem with the uh, bark because was... it was so humid in the bamboo. But now that we felled the bamboo, look at all this new growth on the western side. Uh. So it's gonna balance the trees out. Oh, so this was really like all barren before. I, dude, this the, side. the bamboo went all the way into the wall and under, under the floor of the kura. That's amazing. 
That's incredible. Now this is bamboo, but the bamboo only grows six inches tall. So that this varietal never gets bigger than Correct. this. Correct. Was that in, a, intentional planting? Yes, or? Okay. intentional. So these are California uh, pomegranates. We've got three of them. We've got some Japanese plum here you can see. Oh yeah, you can see one right there. Here. This is a colby, and they make beautiful crimson flowers. And then that's Japanese black pine. This center big tree is a sycamore or plane tree. And then we've got different kinds of azalea scattered throughout. This is quince. Oh, quince. Makes jelly or you can yeah. just, you know, bring it I've never seen a quince tree. Then this is Japanese sumac, which they use for lacquerware. Okay. And it makes really deep, deep red leaves in um, autumn. Ah. Is it, but it's con isn't sumac considered poisonous? Yeah, yeah it, it'll, it'll make you itch okay. if you come in contact with the sap. Absolutely. Okay. And then, so these Tsukiyama, the, the mountains were built. And I'll, oh, you built these? Yeah, and this these one. These three and this one? Yep, with okay, okay. excavators and the like. Okay, okay. And then I carried each of those stones and built the staircase. And we decided, you know, all the trees and where they'd go and the varieties. This is um, Nanking Haze. It's a beautiful tree in autumn. It makes purple and orange and yellow leaves. It's, it's mm. stunning in autumn. Ooh, the pods are interesting. And then this tree in the distance is a katsura tree, also called a Judas tree. The leaves are cute, heart-shaped. In autumn, they turn lovely color, but the entire tree smells like cotton candy in autumn it's, or, or toasted marshmallow. Oh, wow. But so, not now. No, in, in autumn. And so what's, just question, the staircase, mm -hmm. what's the staircase for? Go up and see. Okay, let me have a look at that. It's just a viewpoint. And watch how the view of the house and the garden changes from up there. Yeah. Are these seats? Oh, nice. Oh. That tree right in front of your face is a different kind of cherry tree. It's a beautiful, it's called Yai Zakura. Yai Zakura? Mm. And that's an Akamatsu or a red pine behind you. Ah, okay. So these are meant to mimic these hills. Exactly. Wow. And this, what a statue? Oh, it's a stone pagoda. Pagoda. What is that? What are those for, really? Well, it's a Buddhist thing. It represents, you know, like in Nara, you have the pagoda. All right. So, you know, the, the levels of the universe. Oh, that's what it means. Okay. And, you know, in autumn, what I wanted is we'll train over time the pine to partially obscure this. And then when this goes in autumn, you know, picture it orange and purple. So it's, it's got that against it as a backdrop. The idea behind Japanese gardening is that you never see a straight line of sight. And as you turn each corner, first you, you design the path so that people have to change their perspective and they get different things revealed. Mm. But part of that is growing in the trees to obscure, you know, intentionally. Wow. This is the red. Oh. oh, that's brilliant. What's the red pagoda thing? The gate, like the... Oh, over there? Yeah. It's a decommissioned... Um, it's a decommissioned gate. Gate. Temple. <laughs> where did it, where'd it come from? It was blown down in a storm and it's made of Japanese elm. Uh, and a gardener I know was responsible for cleaning up and he said to the head priest, are you going to throw this away? And the priest said, yeah, it's a shame, it's nice wood. So the gardener says, well, I know somebody who might take it. <laughs> Takes so, everything. <laughs> so the, the, the priest decommissioned it, so to speak. Uh -huh. and, and then I'll, I'll rip it into planks. Oh, you can't just put it right, right there? No, 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 it's, it's 
it's all in it's been torn apart oh and for me to do that i'd have to have it reconsecrated and oh so what's what about all of this 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 is all stone you and, installed all of this yes all the stone the stone wall was not here this pathway was not here none of these trees or shrubs were here this is all just bamboo and then are these are these lanterns? Those two there? That's or? a lantern. That's a so you put like a candle in it? Yes. Or? That's a shrine. That's a shrine. Okay. And this is a hand washing basin, but I use it to catch the water that comes off of the oh. spout. Like people would use that to, to wash their hands. Yeah. Literally? When it was a when it was a restroom. Oh, that's from the restroom. When it was like a drop toilet. Yeah. Hmm. I'm gonna turn this into an outdoor indoor bath. So you see the window here? Yes. I'm going to add another one on the west face and another one on the south face, uh -huh. and then install a two-person tub, oh. and you'll be able to look out and see all the different garden views while you soak. Nice. nice. And then Kind this, of like your own onsen here. Basically. Uh, and then this I built. The stone was given to me uh, and installed, and I built this water. It's a recirculating pump inside uh -huh. the pond. You can see I've got tiny fish. Those are medaka, uh, uh, Japanese rice or kili fish, uh -huh. and they control all of the mosquito larvae. Oh. Now, did you carve the? Uh... No. So that that was given to me as is. I, I did. It, so it's already built to be that. Yeah. And then what? Are, this? These are. That's another ishidoro, another stone lantern. I've collected several over the years. So people would use those by just putting. Well, how would they? What would they? They put, put a candle. Oh, literally a candle. Like an oil candle, typically. Okay. Yeah. And they would put that in there. If, would these go around houses or in villages? Or so they work? would have been on a property, uh, it, sort of like pathway lights. Mm hmm. Hmm. And then these buildings, the exteriors are concrete? No. This is uh, Japanese plaster. Shikui. Are they, is that pretty durable? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I haven't touched it. We need to get someone to come in and just touch up the surface. Okay. And then this was not here. Obviously, this was flat, and it was all bamboo. Um, I designed and had installed this feature with more stones that were given to us. These stones came from a garden that was being torn apart. Oh. So um, I got all these stones and another stone bridge. Now, this is pretty wild. I, I haven't been up here for about two weeks in terms of in this area. trimming. So I've got to come in and retrim, and you know these German irises. Or sorry, not German irises. A different kind of iris. They've gone bonkers. I need to really winnow them back. I've got some vines I need to pull. This season, it's hard to keep up with a garden this size with just the two of us. You really need to hire household staff. And then I put this. Uh, I put this ground cover. The bees. Here's a bee. The bees oh. absolutely love it. Might get out of the light. You'll see it better. So, you know, we try to, as much as possible, not mow too much, uh -huh. leave lots of different flowering plants for the pollinators. And then this tree was surrounded by bamboo and it was, when we uncovered it, it was, I don't know, four inches in diameter. Uh, and then once we got rid of the bamboo, the tree took off. Now, these become huge. They will have, you know, the trees in Thailand that have the buttress root system, like a cathedral, like yes. a, that's, these will have those and they'll grow to be 40 meters tall. Oh, wow. Someday. Someday. Uh, and then this was elsewhere in the garden, same kind of tree. It had landed naturally and it had grown to again about four, maybe five inches in diameter. And I moved it here so that the two would form an archway and we kind of say that this one is me and this one's her. You could see that one's <laughs> far more delicate and slender. That This one's a bit rough and tumble. A rough and strong. tumble. Yeah, a little bit dirty over there, a little yep, bit dirty. Yep. The, the gardener uh, was just like, these are garbage <laughs> trees. Why do you want these trees? <laughs> but we, uh, we love them. And, um, you know, f it was great over a few years watching going, oh, they're, they're, the leaves are just just touching. And, and now, <laughs> now you know, it's a proper canopy. Together. Nice. And, you know, feel the difference in temperature. Oh, yeah. So one of the things that drives me spare about Tokyo is that they tear out every damn tree they see. Whereas we've planted at least 50 trees since we bought the place. And the difference in temperature is astounding. Yeah. That's another Katsura tree. So right outside our bedroom window, you can smell the, the beautiful the... cotton candy. So all of these, like, lanterns... Yep. 
Lantern. Yeah. More lanterns. Yes. You just all source that. Yes. It's all him. That's like incredible they to me. They show dude. up like mushrooms. So the people are like, we'll give them to you because they're trying to get rid of those? Some, yeah. some, of, the, some of them have been given. That one in the distance was given. The rest I've bought. Um, one from a stone dealer that's a neighbor. Mm -hmm. uh, others I find uh, at auction or... Are they expensive? Well, it depends on how you look at it. Okay. So my prices, no. Okay. Uh, I might spend $300 for one at auction. I might spend as much as 1500 bucks for a, a particularly big one. Uh, but if you were to go without the connections that I've had and try to source them at a retail garden center, you'd be looking at five, six, seven thousand or more for okay. some of them. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, I've, I've, because I've done most of the labor and because I've got friends who are in the business and because I've got different connections, I, I haven't spent very much relative. I have a friend who just built a house in Tokyo, tiny postage stamp lot. He has probably, um, I don't know, two meter by three meter. So what, like six by nine? plot of land. That's his house? And, no, in front of his house. Oh, for, in front for, of, for oh, a yard. <laughs> and he wanted somebody to come in and put in one stone, one tree. And they wanted over 10 grand. 10 grand US? F for a tree and a stone. Whoa. You know, uh, I've spent tens of thousands on the garden, but I've got a three quarter acre yard. Right, right. Filled with multiple lanterns, probably close on a hundred ton of stone. You know, and it's all landscape to my spec. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, this is this is epic gardening here, man. This is like it's our escape. I'm from amazed the by it. Jungle. It's fantastic. All right, well, that's the tour. Awesome. So these are more stones for more projects. So these are going to be the ones that are the walkway. Oh, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually measure each length and width and shape. And then I'm going to use an aerial view of the house. And then using each of them that I've measured, I'm going to lay it out on the computer, do my, you know, my schematic, and then I'll have them installed. I'll need to get somebody in with a crane, a two-ton crane. I, I can't move these by hand. Yeah, this, this, this looks rather... You're looking at several hundred kilograms, yeah. probably 800 pounds for some of the big ones. And then what's this framing? That leftover, that's the aluminum frames that I pulled oh, out. from the... But what I'm going to do, I've, I've kept all the doors. I'm going right. to build a greenhouse. Oh. Rather than throw them away, I'll lay a foundation and build a greenhouse using all the old sliding glass Where doors. Where you Where? Yeah. Probably in the west. On the west, okay. And then what are these buildings? These... Well, so these are just okiba. They're, they're sheds. Uh -huh. And this one, I've replaced the roof. Uh, I rebuilt all the wood and every and I restained it, but I need to get someone in to fix I don't have the skill to fix the plaster. So that's you can see this is waddle here It seems like it'd be simple to do well simple to do but to make it look good. That's a whole other mm. animal So this is waddle and daub. So here you can see you've got bamboo lathing laths laths for the frame mm -hmm. then you've got straw some dung and dirt all mixed together mm -hmm. and then you've got about three different layers of Plaster. This is three layers? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, this is some old school stuff right here. Yeah, so I'll bring, there, there are people who can still do it, uh, and they'll do it for me. I'll probably not replace it. There used to be earthen wall up there. Oh, I see it from the other side, yeah. Yeah, but I'll keep that open, because it's great ventilation, and just do these walls. So you don't necessarily have to worry about like keeping that totally closed? No, there. no, no, it's just a shed. This one, unfortunately, is too far gone. These beams are rotted to hell and gone. Uh -huh. So once I redo the floor in the warehouse, I'll tear this one down and rebuild it with the same design, but new beams. So these are just basic sheds then? Yep. Um, so I've got a table saw, I've got a jointer. And oh, you've got actual work wood here? Yeah, industrial tools. But they're out in a shed. So, you know, I, I bring out an extension cord. I've got uh, 200 volt three phase power here. You have three phase power here? I had it installed because I have industrial tools. Okay. How, is that expensive to have three phase power? Cord? Installed was about a thousand bucks, but then per kilowatt hour is much cheaper. Right, right. But the thousand 
compared to life in the U.S., man, thousand dollars to put in a three-phase power is pretty darn cheap. Oh, is it? Okay. Oh my gosh, like that's it's like ten thousand dollars to put in. Yeah, no, it was it was a grand. Oh, great. So I'll redo the shed or the the kuda. I'll put all that in the first floor, and then once that's done, tear this down, rebuild it from the ground up, and use it to store things like our our log splitter, our lawnmower, etc. I imagine that there's some of the material here you could salvage. Yeah, honestly, most of it, truly, it's it's shot. I've oh, gone through, bad? and I've you know tested. It's all termite damage. Oh look, they came up through this post. Oh. Right. And then look. They're still active. No. Oh, okay. Not active, but you know, damage is done. Yeah, yeah. And, and then how about the fence? That came. That's that's old. That's Will you probably keep that hundred or? years old. I can't. It's broken. But I'll rebuild it. You'll rebuild it. Okay. And then this is one of the latest projects. I'm using um, giant granite pavers, and those are um, millstones. Oh yeah. I'm building a walkway. So I'll, I'm laying them out at the moment. Then I've got to get granite for the runners on either side. And then I'll raise them all up to the same level and then use um, dry mortar to seal them all in. Okay, nice. And that's the house. Oh, and then just more sheds here. Yep, garden shed. Um, this is Ipe. You know Ipe, the stuff they use to make boardwalks on the East Coast in the States? Mm. So I'm building an Ipe deck here on this face and on the, um, the south face of the of the living room. And you can see it's about what, a meter, meter and a half yeah, yeah. long. So just enough to put a chair out. Oh, beautiful. Oh, one thing you were saying, you, on the other shed, you replace the roof mm -hmm. with the ceramic tile. Yes. Does that stuff have to be like custom done? Custom made or because- No, the, the tiles are a set size, but the, the skill would be in the craftsman. I had somebody come in who came in and did the run and then adjusted the length of, or the width of the last set. I see. Yeah. I see. How about uh huh? No, go ahead. How about these uh, rain things? Rain chains, Keshok Sari. So these are called Keshok Sari, and they're solid copper. You could never have this in the states because it'd be stolen. Unfortunately, <laughs> well, that's the truth. <laughs> don't, you know, uh, in the Hawaii, laughter is not because it's in Hawaii they have them, but they're made of plastic. Right, right. But what's beautiful is essentially the gutter. They come down and it creates this running waterfall almost into this basin a lot yeah, nicer than your typical gutter yeah they're very pretty they're yeah. very pretty and then what are the balls oh uh, they're just decorative oh okay you know what's kind of funny though crows like them and oh. young young crows will come in and they'll like go bobbing for apples almost and then just drop them on the grass oh nice yeah it's kind of cool what about the warehouse so the kuda, That's what I'm curious. I'm curious. It's a it's a mess inside because I'm tearing it apart, so I That's won't open it up. But just from the outside. What did they use this for originally? Rice storing rice. Because they were a rice family, or just because they liked to wealthy eat? wealthy families would have to store rice and valuables. It's waterproof. It's fireproof. The walls are about forty centimeters thick, so. About that, I mean, not qu not door. quite uh, two feet, and uh, you can see you know the massive doors. Yeah, and it's very temperature controlled, so it's doesn't have the wild temperature extremes that the main house would have. So therefore, you're keeping your rice and whatever valuables you have in a more climate controlled, well, 1890s climate control. What's neat is you can put in an air conditioner, a small unit, and because it's so well insulated. You only need a tiny unit. It'll keep it cool year round or warm year round. Makes excellent wine cellar. Oh, I can peek at that. Then. So, what are your plans for this room then? Well, that's going to be my wood shop. The wood shop, okay. Oh yeah, you can feel the coolness yeah. on the face yeah. as I'm pushing up against the. And this was all concrete. It was a concrete slab. It was hideous. I tore it out by hand. Nothing but a pickaxe, uh, <laughs> my back. But the concrete was from later years. Not yeah, it would have been probably from the 50s, I'm okay. guessing. Tore it out and then rebuilt this and designed this all by hand, all the stone. Now, does this have the same construction as the sheds? That, that, yes, that wattle and daub, yep, with, with just thicker. Yeah. 
And then I laid this walkway in. Um, these are the, probably some of the biggest stones I've moved by hand. Ooh. Again, using bamboo as rollers and a big wrecking bar. Did you repaint this building or? That's, um, that's plaster. Both the black and the white are plaster. Original? Well, it's been replastered. Before you? No. When oh, you did? Came, it looked like the other one with the brown oh. showing. And we had some, we had a specialist come in and, and do that. Probably the first year we bought the place. Because we knew that if we didn't, it would, it would deteriorate, deteriorate, right? So how long is the plaster supposed to last? Oh, if you take care of it, a lifetime. But they hadn't taken care of it. They had allowed bamboo to fall against it. Mm. And once you get cracks and damage, then water gets in and you know it, it freezes and expands and, and all that. So care is really just more about preventing the yeah, cracks? absolutely. Okay. And then this bell, um, a friend of mine in Fukuoka worked in a shipyard and he was snorkeling underneath a sailboat one day cleaning and in the dirt, in the sediment, he saw part of the bell sticking out. So he gave it to me. I built this roof and mount for it and I did this... Uh, uh, monkey's paw. Yeah, monkey paw knot. And it's our doorbell. Nice. Does he they keep showing up? Did you well, see the big pretty, pile? Pretty much I did. So, does being out of room really slow you down? Yeah, no, no, no. I have to be. Because having stones in a garden, you need space as much as you need stone. Otherwise, you just look cluttered. So that, that's, we're done. There's probably room for one more installation with the remaining pile I have. That section of the garden. That's that, well, the, the skiama need to be without stones. No, no, the skiama the left of the Oh, the, the west. That is processing. So that's where we process all of our firewood. That's where the greenhouse is going to go. So. But doesn't the greenhouse need a stone for No. No. Because <laughs> it needs to be level, there needs to be water in it, all of that. Kimberly is... And he said, he said, we're done. You got it on camera. You can refer to this video online if you like it. Aside from that one bridge that I told you. Aside, aside, aside. Yeah, one bridge. But the boulders are done. 